Welcome. Today is Palm Sunday, the start of Holy Week. I am Pastor Brian Mallison. My joy to welcome you to worship today. Hear the story of Jesus' entry into Jerusalem as recorded in St. Mark, the 11th chapter. When they were approaching Jerusalem at Bethphage and Bethany near Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples and said to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and immediately as you enter it, you will find tied there a colt that has never been ridden. Untie it and bring it. If anyone says to you, Why are you doing this? Just say this, The Lord needs it, and will send it back immediately. They went away and found a colt tied near a door outside the street. And as they were untying it, some of the bystanders said to them, What are you doing untying the colt? They told them what Jesus had said, and they allowed them to take it. Then they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks on it, and he sat on it. Many people spread their cloaks on the road, and others spread leafy branches that had been cut in the fields. Then those who went ahead and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our ancestor David. Hosanna in the highest heaven. Today we conclude our Lenten worship theme, Crosswalk, with the theme, Jesus, the way to the cross. Jesus not only went to the cross for you and me, but he also invited those who would follow him to take up their crosses. That strange language has caused a lot of people to struggle with the message of Jesus. But I'm so glad that you joined us for worship today so that we may gain a deeper insight into the joy of believing in the Lordship of Jesus and discovering the depth of living a life of faith. Just a reminder that we will celebrate the Sacrament of Holy Communion toward the end of the service. If you would like to um, have now ready for that time of the service, a small piece of bread, a small cup of wine or grape juice. Once again, welcome. We gather for worship in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.
hearts are yearning. We love the Lord. Cause when we see you, we find strength to face the day. In your presence, all our fears are washed away, washed away. of people came into Jerusalem to welcome Jesus as the incoming Savior, so we too await our Messiah. We're also hungry for a hero. We crave to glimpse greatness. We crane our necks to see him. But are we willing to follow the one that comes on a donkey? Let us as followers of Jesus who live in a broken world and who often lose heart, join together in a prayer of confession. Let us pray. Almighty God, we confess our self-centeredness, our betrayal of those we love, our need to scapegoat and find targets for our anger and disappointment, we confess the violence in our hearts revealed in injustice, hard-heartedness, in harsh judgments and fear of those who differ from us or disagree with us. We confess our fear of radical discipleship, radical love, radical commitment to what Jesus was most passionate about. We confess our failure to see all of life as a gift and to praise you for your goodness, mercy, and grace. Gracious God, forgive us, renew us, and lead us so that we may be joyful in following you and doing your will for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. The good news is that Jesus Christ's life, death, and resurrection have set us free to follow a life that more closely follows him. And so it is my great joy to declare to you the entire forgiveness of all your sin in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Having my church community has been very helpful during this time and knowing that even though I live by myself and there are times where I really do feel alone, um, being able to worship still with, you know, technology and, and YouTube and um, Bible studies on Zoom um, really has been helpful knowing that technology is there and uh, has been a great tool for our church to use so that we don't have to, you know, cancel church. We're still meeting, even though it's not in person. Um, I think that's 
that's amazing that we're able to keep each other safe and still keep each other, um, you know, prioritize worship in that way. Um, I think um, that's been a great way to um, really see faith in action um, and see our church's mission statement in action as well that we're able to say you know church isn't canceled and church was never a building to begin with church was church is still happening even though it's on youtube that doesn't mean it's not church anymore um that's been that's been a big part of my sunday mornings is that you know i still don't skip church even though um it's it's at home now and the messages that i hear at church help me they ground me i hear messages of hope i hear messages of even though we're in a pandemic there are still things you can do that that god is still speaking to us in this time and and god is using this time um, to to call us to to bigger things just have that comfort in this is something that is the same when everything else is different um, you know church is church is there this community is there um, this community will always be there no matter what it looks like. Um, this is a community that's here for the people. Oh, no. 
Mark 8, 34 through 37. Jesus called the crowd with his disciples and said to them, If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their, lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. For what will it profit them to gain the whole world and forfeit their life? Indeed, what can they give in return for their life? Here ends the reading. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Believe it or not, there's a forum that you can join on the internet to discuss and debate how many miles Jesus walked in his ministry. Kid you not. Now, I'm kind of a Bible geek. I love digging into interesting facts about Jesus, but... Um, this stuff is rather extreme Bible geekiness. And here's the consensus. Jesus walked 3,125 miles in his three-year ministry. That would come to about 20 miles a day. I get winded when I walk 20 steps a day. <laughs> so what's different about today is that Jesus does no walking. He rides a donkey. It's a, a parade of sort. He gets carried by a donkey roughly two miles from the Mount of Olives into Jerusalem. The parade enters through the eastern gate of Jerusalem called the Golden Gate. And a group of folks line the streets and put down palm branches and cloaks. And they shout, Hosanna. But this isn't the only parade 
in Jerusalem on that day. On the other side of town, there's a bigger and more festive parade. Entering the western gate of the city, the main gate, was none other than Governor Pilate riding a war horse decked out in armor with banners waving and troops behind him. Every year at Passover, while Jews from all over come into Jerusalem to celebrate their freedom from the Egyptians, the Roman officials would make sure to have a pageantry display of strength and power. And no Jew could miss the point. Their celebration of the Passover was happening at the tolerant pleasure of the Roman government. Two parades that day into the city couldn't be more different. One was a display of power, the other a presentation of humility, one an in-your-face statement of militaristic strength, the other maybe an overlooked statement of subversive intent. Make no mistake, this is a story about two different kingdoms. And in the final week of Jesus' life, these two kingdoms collide. And today, Palm Sunday, is its beginning. So, pretty much, we are left with wondering what parade we want to follow. It would be like two parades in a city, one with the team that won the Super Bowl, and one with people carrying get out the vote signs. Which would you go to? It would be like two parades on New Year's Day, one with floats and marching bands and one with underemployed workers fighting for fair wages. Which would you go to? We like big and brash and colorful and loud symbols of winning and victory and status. It's easy to pass on things that aren't glitzy and that remind us of everyday struggles that some people have. But if you had followed Jesus' parade through the Eastern Gate into Jerusalem, well then maybe you might join him in the upper room a couple of days later as he talked about betrayal and denial. You might watch as he broke bread that he called his body and poured into a cup wine that he said was his blood. And then you might follow the parade out into a garden and watch as he fervently prayed for the cup of suffering to pass from him and then watch as his friend turned him into the police and he was arrested and then followed the parade as Jesus was marched into town, set up in a kangaroo court, tried and convicted without evidence, and laughed at, and mocked, and stripped naked, slapped around, and beaten mercilessly. And then, of course, you would watch as Jesus walked his final steps of his life. From Pilate's palace to the hill called Golgotha. It's about 650 yards, roughly 2,000 steps, but it would be the hardest walk of Jesus' life. And of course, he was labored with the weight of a crossbar for a cross, roughly 80, 90 pounds heavy. Now, if you hung around Jesus prior to his parade, Maybe this moment would remind you of something he said a while ago. If you want to become my follower, deny yourself. Take up your cross and follow me. And at that moment, you might have thought, wait a second. Jesus wants me to join him in a parade of self-denial and death. You've, you've got to be kidding me, Jesus. But of course, he wasn't kidding. 
He, he had never been so serious. I have a friend who is a pastor of a huge church in the Midwest, and he tells me that he preaches this text from the Gospel of Mark once a year in his words to clean house, so to speak. Because he wants his church to fully understand that this Christian life is not a walk in the park, not something to be taken lightly, but a parade of self-denying servants willing to give their life. So let me ask you, what do you know about Pontius Pilate? Virtually nothing, right? I mean, what city was he born into? No idea. What was his wife's name? Having a clue. How many kids did he have? Not sure. Where was he buried? Don't know. But here was a guy who propped himself up as the epitome of power and strength, who made sure that everyone not only knew who he was, but also what he stood for and the influence that he had. But 2,000 years later, he's only a footnote in human history. <laughs> not a very good one. But Jesus, on the other hand, well, Jesus stands above all others as one who represents goodness, who freely forgave people their errors, who served others selflessly, who gave what he had to those in need, who paid attention to those who are overlooked, who touched the untouchable, who comforted the discomforted, and who quite simply loved purely. And we remember him. I mean, all of history remembers him. Even those who disbelieve his divinity consider him something different than others down through the ages. And now, and now he leads those who do believe in him, who find their lives changed by him. And he leads them in a new parade. These people are a different breed. They don't think or act like most others. They do not march to the beat of cultural drums. They think about others, go out of their way to serve people they don't even know. They involve themselves in causes that promote health and well-being for others. They march in streets with others seeking justice and hope. They bind the wounds, clothe the naked, visit the prisoners, and they do it all freely. They're called the church. You know this to be true, don't you? You and I and our people, we, we know this. Because each and every time we make ourselves vulnerable to the needs of those around us, each time we give ourselves in love to another, each time we get out of our own way and seek not what we want, but what the world needs, <laughs> we come alive. We're uplifted. We experience something powerful. That's what Jesus means when he invites his disciples then and now to take up their cross and follow him because only those who are willing to lose their life out of love will save it. Well, let's be clear though. I'm not talking about and quite confident Jesus isn't talking about a kind of doormat mentality where we let others deprive us of dignity and respect. There is no justification for enduring abusive relationships or in tolerating, or tolerating injustice. Rather, I'm talking about giving ourselves in love, which is, of course, quite different than having others take it from us. And that giving in love almost 
always includes sacrifice, denying ourselves, and giving up our immediate gratification so as to meet another's needs. Again, we know this to be true. We do it perhaps most naturally as parents, sacrificing all kinds of things in hope of providing them for our children. But we also do it as children for aging parents or neighbors for neighbors in need or church members for those who go to the same church who require some assistance. And each time we do so, each time that is, we set aside our own agenda to satisfy a genuine need of someone else, we experience the joy of faith. I, I think we know this. But let's be honest, it's hard to hold on to. We get lured in to want to follow Pilate's parade. Don't you think some of those disciples of Jesus wanted to slip away and go watch the other parade going on in Jerusalem? That parade, after all, suggests that the only way to go is to be stronger than others, wealthier than others, above others, not in need of others, bigger, stronger, wealthier, greater. It makes for a good show. But Pilate's parade is a lie. This, I think, is why I call Jesus' parade subversive. It's counterintuitive. The more we give, the more we receive. The more we forgive, the more we value being forgiven. The more we seek to be a friend, the more friends we discover. And the more we love, the more we're loved. Oh, how I hope we know this. But we do forget. Which is why we're here today, on this day, in worship, as we begin the final walk with Jesus into Holy Week. Because we need to be reminded that Jesus has come and doesn't just say these words, he also lives them, giving himself out of love for all people and creating an image of life that is far greater than anything Pilate in the world can offer. And inasmuch as he does this for the world, the good news is that Jesus does this for you. So join the parade. Amen. Confident that we approach a God who hears us, please join me in prayer for our community and for our world. Gracious and almighty God, we humbly ask that you enter into our hearts and lives, hear our cries of joy and of grief, our distress and our hosannas, 
for ourselves and for this broken world that groans for your restoration this day and every day. We pray for those who do not know you and ask for opportunities to share the joy of our faith and the confidence of a savior. God, we ask that you would provide protection and support to the students and teachers who have returned to in-person school in our community. Relieve any worry, open their minds to new learning and keep them safe from illness and injury. Healing God, we ask for your restoration on all who suffer injury and illness of body, mind, or emotions. Heal the sick, comfort the grieving, soothe the anxious, and encourage the distressed, we pray. God, we cry for mercy as the COVID-19 pandemic continues to create loss, grief, and trauma, even as we pray in gratitude for all who work to provide vaccines and ask that their efforts will help us to enter a new era. Give us strength and emotional courage to stay the course, to love our neighbors, and to be ambassadors for you in these times. Comforter, God, we are in distress that we cannot even name as we witness shootings across this nation and violence in our communities. For those whose lives have been altered by violent acts in Hanford, we cry for mercy and comfort. For the community of Boulder, Colorado and the disruption of violence, especially for those who grieve those shot and killed, we pray. With the families and friends of those killed in Atlanta, and with Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders who are confronted by many of expressions of hate, we lament. Merciful God, help us to actively love in opposition to these acts of hate. And God, as we enter Holy Week, we pray for all in church leadership. We ask that you will bless them with a true experience of Easter, even amidst their work, exhaustion, and the grief surrounding this era. We ask your protection upon congregations who gather and pray that your presence and goodness will be tangible in new ways. May the resurrection and new life of Jesus Christ be the defining factor in all of our lives and all of our actions. We ask these and all things unsaid in the name of Jesus Christ, our beloved Savior. Amen. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory of yours now and forever. Amen. Once again, welcome to Christ Lutheran Church. I have a couple of very important announcements to share with you. During January and February, Christ Lutheran Church served dinner at the Lamplighter for folks who are experiencing homelessness. We had a team of about a dozen and a half folks who shared the responsibility of weekly preparing those meals. It was a wonderful way for us to help people who are going through challenges in life. Although the residents at the Lamplighter have now moved on to other settings, we knew, now have the opportunity to serve even more folks who have been previously on the streets. Beginning this coming Tuesday, the 30th, and for every Tuesday after, Christ Lutheran Church members are invited to join the team that will provide a Tuesday meal for residents at Sequoia Lodge on Mooney Boulevard. The residents are housed there under Project Room Key Initiative and are cared for by a team of supervisors. If you would like to assist in this ministry, please contact me at brian at clcvisalia.org or call the church office. I will put you in touch with Julia Doyle, who is heading up this ministry team. We would love to add many more names to the team of those who will be offering this very significant service of love. Again, please contact me at the church to sign up or if you have any questions. And Holy Week is here. April 1st is Monday, Thursday, April 2nd, Good Friday, and Easter is Sunday, April 4th. 
Now please pay close attention, for I have very important information about these services to share with you. Monday Thursday worship will be both online and on campus. The online service will be posted at noon on Monday Thursday. The on-campus service will be at 7 in the evening. Now, if you are planning on attending the on-campus service, please call the church office for reservations, or you may go online at the Christ Lutheran Church website to make your reservations. Now, we can only accommodate so many people, and already many spots have been taken. So it's really important for you to make reservations today if you would like to participate on our Monday Thursday worship service and the need for social distancing and face masks will be observed. The Good Friday service will only be online and again will be posted at noon. But Easter Sunday we will not only have an online service but also an on-campus service. There will be two services, one at 6.30 in the morning, one at 8 o'clock. And the 8 o'clock service is already filled. There are yet limited spaces available for 6.30. So please make those reservations again by calling the church office or by logging on to the online reservation system that you can access through our website. And just a reminder once again, face masks and social distancing will be observed. And good news, we have just added a 9.30 Easter Sunday worship service. So please make your reservations now, call the church office or go online to find that reservation and to identify the number of people who will be joining you. We look forward to seeing you on Easter Sunday.
And now we gather to celebrate the sacrament of Holy Communion. For those who wish to fast forward to the benediction and to the end of the service, you are welcome to do so now. For those who wish to celebrate the sacrament, I invite you to have prepared for you already the bread and the cup of wine or grape juice. In this important week when the sacrament of Holy Communion takes center stage on Thursday evening, we recall that everything about this week points to the great love that God has for us through Jesus because of our sin, because of our inability to, to fix our lives and to make right that which is broken, Jesus came among us, bore the weight of human sin, and defeated death, which is the wages of sin. In this meal, we receive forgiveness, won for us through the death and resurrection that very first Holy Week 2,000 years ago. And so, on the night of his betrayal, Jesus took the bread and gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples saying, take and eat, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, gave it for all to drink saying, this cup is a new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this in remembrance of me. The body of Christ given for you. the blood of Christ shed for you. For as often as we eat of this bread and drink from this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death and resurrection until he comes again. And now receive the benediction. Today and every day. May you be like the donkey who carried Christ into Jerusalem, carrying Christ into the world. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. <laughs>